Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine war news update for the 18th of February 2023. Time flies. Um, so let's go to our usual opening gambit which is Ukrainian release figures for Russian losses for the day before. Usual caveats, inaccurate, uh, propaganda, Russia don't produce the same sort of figures although I think these are very useful for indicative uh, reasons and they are probably more accurate than some critics might think. So first thing to note is that there is another huge day of losses or another day of huge losses for the Russians. Uh, 1,010 liquidated personnel so that is getting up towards a record day. So that indicates that yesterday was a tough day on a battlefield. Quite a lot of news coming out of Bakhmut that um, well, basically overnight, it seems that the, most of the counterattacks that happen in the south of Bakhmut, and I'll show you some evidence of that, seems to take place at night. There's a competitive advantage that, you, that the uh, Ukrainians have in terms of night vision that allows them to uh, wreak havoc uh, amongst the Wagner forces there. Um, but yet there'll be tough fighting up and down the line, Kremina, uh, Svatova, Kupiansk as well. Uh, five tanks, 13 APCs, so a slight uptick there. Um, four artillery systems, two MNRS, two anti-aircraft war warfare systems again uh, s300s i think claim to be hit that is that is a loss to the russians for sure three drones eight uh sorry nine vehicles and fuel tanks and two pieces of special equipment that could be radar could be bridge laying could be any any number of things there so fairly uh difficult day for the for the russians yesterday particularly in terms of uh troops lost if we uh, start looking at building up a picture of, of what happened and what supports those claims, uh, just one example of a hospital in Kherson, 36 liquidated, uh, 18 wounded soldiers were taken. So that that's, you know, it appears that twice as many killed as wounded. Um, were taken to a hospital in Kalanchak, which is in, in the southern Kherson region um, on in the occupied area. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that that's um, from the Ukrainian general staff. So take that with a pinch of salt. But it seems that something bad's happened around uh, Kherson. Uh, interesting to read that the Times it has an in-depth report, and I might look at this later for the extra. Calculates Russia has suffered 166,000 casualties, dead and injured, in just the last three months on the front line, losing 2,000 fighters for every 90 meters advance. So they've calculated the loss rates in terms of what they have also gained to the Russians, and it is a very high cost per meter. 2,000 fighters for every 90 meters is absolutely incredible. Um, but of course, you know, we'll need to look at that and, and, and check that over. Uh, in terms of verified losses, so this is, you know, absolutely uh, bare minimum. Again, this won't have happened yesterday, but uh, Oryx, the aggregator of um, visually confirmed losses for both sides, says yesterday, you know, 43, uh, including, you know, a whole bunch of tanks, 43 yesterday for the Russians, and they had 14 losses for the Ukrainians. So that's at a ratio of about, uh, you know, three to one. Uh, just, for, just for yesterday. I don't know whether that fits into what they've had for the last week, but but uh, uh, yeah, and you know, for the two days before, 29 losses for the Russians and 47. So Russians are losing a lot of equipment um, very consistently if this is anything to go by. Uh, and then further on casualties, the US thinks that the mercenary group Wagner has suffered, this is according to CNN, well, this is according to US intelligence, has suffered more than 30,000 casualties, including roughly 9,000 fighters killed. Uh, about 4,500 of those, so half of them killed since mid-December. So actually, that's if you add that time up, that's two months, 9,000 killed, uh, sorry, 4,500 of their deaths have happened in two months. So that's uh, quite phenomenal losses for Wagner, as according to the Americans. Now, what could what could lead to such deaths? Well, the last couple of days, particularly last night, there was a lot of talk on the socials about special forces attacks. Uh, I think in the south of Bakhmut, where they're pushing back in the Ivaniska area, uh, there's a lot of footage coming out. I won't show it to you because uh, a lot of it's pretty inappropriate. Um, but here's so special forces counteroffensive in Bakhmut stormed Wagner criminals' illegal base and eliminated more than 65 Russians, wounding a dozen and capturing 30 surviving mercenaries. Um, 
that is a pretty uh, pretty high numbers for the Russian losses. And then, you know, if, if you don't believe that, there's quite a lot of um, video footage that you can check out. In a three-hour-long battle that lasted on the outskirts of Bakhmut yesterday night, resulted in seven Ukrainian special forces. So I think there's... So this is reporting on one, but this there is more than one. So when I think this might um, accumulate all the numbers, but there is one where there's only like seven of them taking out something like 40 soldiers here or something. So seven special forces soldiers with the support of snipers repelling an assault of more than 40 uh, soldiers who took 20 plus casualties and then retreated. So that's 20 uh, plus casualties that be wounded and dead out of 40. So seven soldiers taking out an attack of 40. And then you've got a sniper working on the 71st Brigade tells a story of how the Russian offensive is going so far. So that comes with some footage and a bit of bit of a, an interview there. Um, and uh, uh, then some more footage, a night battle in the Bakhmut area, five soldiers of the special forces, Azov Kharkov, um, and two soldiers of the Dozor unit entered the battle with a Wagner group. The battle lasted three hours. 35 mercenaries were eliminated after which the enemy retreated to the original position. So you can see that's the same battle as this one, but this is saying 20 plus, uh, and this is saying 35 were eliminated, um, whether that means dead or wounded. So there's going to be varying numbers there, and there's going to be a lot of guesswork because a lot of these, it's just people you can see in the distance. But there is quite a bit of different footage coming out about um, from night exchanges in the Bakhmut area. And I talked to you in the last couple of days about the importance of exploiting competitive advantages. So if, if you're mano a mano in this urban environment, you're going to lose about the same amount of troops and it's just just going to be gritty and attritional and horrible for both sides. So if you're one of those sides, you have to exploit whatever advantage you can get. If that's in terms of technical advantage, so if you've got night vision and they don't, then all of your fighting should be at night. Uh, that's what that's what you want to be doing because you have the advantage. And there's some incredible uh, sniper work going on. I talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about, I don't know why Ukrainians haven't had like a thousand people trained up on the best sniper uh, weapons you can get with the best optics you can get and just shove them all in, shove like 200 snipers in, one in every building in, in Bakhmut. And you just, you cause absolute mayhem for for the Russians. Um, anyway, a reality check. Wagner PMC mercenaries complain that their supply lines have dried up. So they've been complaining about this. Personally, there's lots of videos. Here's another one um, saying that, that the Russian regular army seemed to not be supplying them with artillery shells and ammunition. So there's this uh, tension, schism between the regular Russian army and the Wagner as they the, the regular army seem to be trying to phase Wagner out. Well, these guys complain that their supply lines are dried up and that they're losing huge amounts of men. So again, it goes back to what are the jigsaw pieces that 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 um, make this picture up, right? And and support these claims from the Ukrainian general staff. Uh, and here's another video that that's also on the back of a bunch of other Wagner videos, but this one talking about they're losing a lot of a lot of men and then i won't show you because it's really inappropriate but this room is full of dead bodies so it pans around and they're all like russian wagner it's all their own dead bodies in this video around 20 bodies of dead mercenaries can be seen so again that's coming from wagner themselves so if you if you don't believe the general staff and you don't believe the americans reporting about you know in cnn about wagner losses will take it from wagner themselves um Okay, then moving on from losses, let's look at Russia on fire. So a couple more big blazes. Uh, one more incident to report. This one is so good it lasted four days. The blaze, which started on Monday at a warehouse in Krasnoyarsk, has finally been put out. Strange combination. They stored their timber and alcohol. Uh, seriously. Uh, and then a, a, another one burning a, a, a warehouse in Ufa, Kresol chemical plants. Uh, again, that one looks somewhat suspicious given, you know, it, it's a chemical plant, more of an industrial setting. Um, but yeah, so that that's Russia on fire. Let's move on to other things. Just to add, sorry, uh, we'll talk about that Kherson hospital. That could have come from a Ukrainian hit uh, on a concentration of Russian soldiers on the left bank of uh, the Dnipro. Reports uh, the operational command that, that a place in Pivden has been hit. 18 occupants, six units of equipment, including uh, S-300 launcher. Uh, so that goes to that that air defense system, or two of them being taken out. Two cannons, Hyacinth B, so the two types of uh, um how it's uh, and three uh, 
automobile unit uh, vehicles basically were destroyed also five depots and ammunition and observation posts in in the occupiers uh, regions were demilitarized says the statement so lots of activity going on uh, behind the lines okay now moving on to other things i wrote uh, an article back in when was it april last year talking about how P does well i asked does putin have parkinson's and give me all the evidence that he has both parkinson's and almost certainly some form of cancer uh, he's been seen by a cancer doctor something like uh, i mean at the time it was like 136 times in a year i don't know some some huge amount of times and then there's lots of evidence he keeps um holding desks and stuff like that when and stabilizing himself the way he stands uh, the way the way his posture is his the steroids he's he's got a very puffy face now that he never used to have um uh, he the way that uh he's very so during covid it was super amounts of protection there was a tunnel going into his his sort of residence where you had to get sprayed as you walk through all sorts of evidence you put together you say he's got something he's certainly got some form of cancer there's different theories whether it's blood cancer liver cancer etc 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 well there's also a lot of talk about parkinson's now Putin's continuing problem to control his legs and arms has been visible again today. When he met Lukashenko, this man is medically sick. Uh, Russia's losing war will almost certainly expedite his worsening condition. There's also theories that, that being on steroids is makes you very irrational and somewhat angry. And, and so therefore, this could explain his kind of fairly irrational decision making over the last couple of years. Well, this is further evidence that he is indeed ill. Go and check out my article, Does Putin Have Parkinson's Disease from April? And then add that to the um the you know evidence draw and see if it all kind of um makes sense. Uh, British Defence Minister Ben Wallace has stated that there are no indications of an upcoming major offensive by Russian military in Ukraine and that they should truly be wondering if Russia can continue to go on. So this is from the Financial Times. Um, despite fears that Russia is poised to launch a huge attack for around the first anniversary of its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Ben Wallace said, and he's the Defence Secretary for the UK, no evidence of a big massing of Russian forces akin to the assault on February the 24th last year. He added that uh, Kyiv's Western allies were more resolved than ever to help Ukraine repel Russian forces. And one clear sign was a strengthening of support um, from the US, which is now committed to seeing the conflict through to the end. There is no evidence to date of a great big Russian offensive. Uh, he said, what we have seen is an advance on all fronts, but at the expense of thousands of lives, we should actually question the assertion that they, the Russians, can go on. So this is going back again on what was originally thought a couple of weeks ago, that Russia are getting ready for a massive offensive. There just isn't the evidence there. And I keep wondering, I've had conversations in the threads about this. I just, I'm so conflicted on this. I'm like, I, if this is it, it can't be it. Like, there's, there has to be more for the Russians. Like, this offensive can't be the big offensive. It has to be a pre-offensive offensive. But then there doesn't appear to be the evidence that there is this big offensive following on behind, that they've got an amassing of troops that can actually do, and material that can actually do the job of punching through in a really significant way the, the Ukrainian lines. Is it just going to be the slow dribs and drabs of mobilised troops getting, forced, um, getting fed into this attritional gain where it is like 90 metres, 2,000 soldiers? Okay. Uh, that, yeah, not looking good for the Russians. So, I don't know. I could be massively wrong, but this is, you know, international intelligence is saying this. Now, talking about uh, massing of Russian troops, a convoy of 30 buses has been seen in Melitopol heading towards Zaporizhia. It's almost certainly for new arrivals from the mobilized ranks being sent to the front. Is this a case of the dribs and drabs? Is this the huge kind of offensive um, that, that we, that the Ukrainians may be fearing and the west may be fearing i don't know uh i don't know what this represents but there is some kind of movement there okay let's go on to military aid those who can send battle tanks to ukraine should really do so now german chancellor schultz said in the munich security conference so this is the video called into by zelensky it's been taking place yesterday that was taking place yesterday he added that he would be intensively campaigning to get allies moving reports yeah. afp so 180 degrees return wow so uh at so 180 degrees turn so this is incredible that schultz has now become the kind of cheerleader for uh you know, for the European nations and allies to to start giving um, main battle tanks uh, to Ukraine, it's an incredible volte face, uh, but but really welcome for for Ukraine, evidently, and uh, really good news to see Schultz taking lead. And my guess is that um, 
there, there must be some kind of political calculation. So if you're a leader and you've been absolutely trashed by both sides for being like completely in the middle, doing a little bit, but not nearly enough, uh, and, and you see all these other leaders like Duda, you look at Duda, the um, Polish leader who's become super popular because he's really strong, even though like politically there's some problems with what he and his party or, or the the Polish government are doing. Duda has, has suddenly become this very strong um, leader because he's he's just all in with the Ukraine. So, you know, Schultz must be looking to the side there and going, OK, right, and I'm getting absolutely trashed for this. So, right, I might as well just go all in. So it, I'm sure there, there's some kind of calculation where it's like – whatever I think is the right thing to do, like for my own political future, like going all in to support Ukraine at the moment is going to be super popular with the Americans, with, with other European allies, uh, uh, but will also make me look really strong um, to, to external audiences and to internal audiences. And it might be politically very useful for me to do so. So I think, you know, rather than like a man to double business bound, and you're like, well, should I do that? Should I do this? Go, right, I'm doing that. And I'm doing that a lot uh, is, is going to be, you know, uh, more useful for him. Bipartisan group of US lawmakers sent a letter to the US President Joe Biden asking them, uh, him to send F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, CNN reports. Uh, I've talked about how problematic a bunch of jets are, but I think the things should be put in place for jets to be sent, and I'm sure there is training taking place. It's just really difficult to think what jets they should be and how many of them and who supplies them uh, and everything else that goes with supplying those jets. So the entire... A range of supports that has to be put in place from from you know ground crewmen you know ground crew to uh, uh, maintenance and supply logistics fuel spare parts all those things um, and then fixing the right weaponry to it so it's really complicated. Um, Polish Prime Minister stated earlier today that he feels Ukraine cannot win the war against Russia without the supply of combat aircraft. I'd agree, but I just think. That will come next rather than now. Uh, he further stated that Poland, as well as a coalition of European countries, are considering sending MiG-29s, I think that should be now for sure, to Ukraine, but that F-16 are not currently on the table due to Poland having so few of them. Uh, so, yeah, I, I fully agree with giving Ukraine as many of the aircraft that they already have. Uh, I have no problem with that, and they absolutely need that. Uh, VP French, uh, Vice President French National Defence Committee, JL Thierry, uh, stated France supplied Ukraine with an unspecified number of its latest Acheron M MP anti tank missile systems and missiles. Thierry, uh, Thierry, uh, Thierry uh, said that Caesar's Mistral uh, and Acheron. Uh, MPs being sent are doing a very good job. So this is, you know, bigging out the French um, support of uh, Ukraine in terms of arms and also, you know, supporting their own arms industry in, in a very positive way. But what's interesting is, so Dead District says, France has, supplied, has secretly supplied the Ukrainian armed forces with missile Moyenne Porte, uh, fifth generation um, missile anti-tank missile systems, also known as MMP or Akron MP. Uh, and it goes on to talk about how, what they are and how they work and whatnot. But the thing here is that quite often the French, I've talked about this before, the French supply military equipment to various places around the world, but they do it on a the quiet. They are the third biggest arms exporter in the world, France. So they're, you've got a huge arms industry, but they don't always shout about it. So when people slagged off France for not doing enough, that may have been a little short-sighted. So it may have been that France were actually supplying stuff. And when you see the amount of Caesars that are now there, it could have been after they were criticised as well, obviously. But they, it could have been a strong chance that they were actually doing things you know, below the radar, so to speak. Um, and indeed, Paris has accelerated the production of armaments so Kiev can count on early deliveries of additional Caesar self-propelled houses, says the French Foreign Ministry, uh, Catherine Colonna. Um, uh, France is preparing to supply Ukraine with 25 Airmex 10Ps infantry fighting vehicles withdrawn in, from service in 2015. This was reported by French L'Opinion journalist Jean-Dominique Mercier. Uh, very interesting. Again, you know, French are, are certainly stepping up. Um, so whilst they might have also supplied things on the sly, they are definitely uh, in, increasing their supply and vocal support of Ukraine. 
Moving on to the sort of final bits and pieces, uh, training now. So the Pentagon, and this is fantastic. There's so much training going on, we almost don't realize. So the first batch of 635 Ukrainian soldiers has completed a five-week training on Bradley IFVs in Germany. There, there's probably the situation where the trainees become the trainers. So I don't know whether they'll take some of this training back to Ukraine now. And as successive Bradleys come into to service in Ukraine, the training will be might be done by, by the Ukrainians. I don't know. Second group of 710 fighters are, are going to be trained on Bradley and M109A6 Paladins. Um, and that has begun. The third group of 890 soldiers will be begin training on striker IFEs next week. Strikers are arriving today in Bremerhaven port in Germ Germany. So loads of training on American um, uh, vehicles uh, and equipment. Uh, also, hundreds of Ukrainian men have charged across windswept northern England. How joyful for them. In army drills on February the 16th, some of more than 10,000 sent to Britain over the last year to turn them into soldiers in the war against Russia. That training is, is ongoing and it will continue as well. I think there, there, there's agreement now to take further cohorts of uh, Ukrainian soldiers, which is great because, again, it's about competitive advantages. So if you're fighting man against man, okay, night vision's one thing, equipment, guns, uh, weaponry, drones, satellite imagery. These are all the advantages that the Ukrainians can have over the Russians and basic training. So the training the Russians are getting is really poor because the conscripts and mobilized soldiers uh, are being trained by, by by hardly anyone. You know, it's one trainer to however many, and they're not getting the equipment. We've seen these videos come out. The, lots of trainers being sent to the front line, so they have a lack of trainers. They're not getting good training. Ukrainians are getting good basic training. That's another competitive advantage. You start building up these competitive advantages, they, they start having an a, a cumulative effect, and you start translating that into loss ratios. So all of these cumulative effects mean, and they're def in a defensive posture, these guys are attacking in human waves using poor doctrine, poor training, poor equipment, uh, and you start seeing, oh, is there a three-to-one loss ratio? For example, I don't, you know, but I'm saying it's exploiting these competitive advantages. Um, next week, uh, and as it's, this source goes on, it's about striker uh, training. So that's that's a really useful uh, vehicle that the Americans are sending. Okay, uh, expect more of this. So this is something of a a worry, and we've seen this before. Uh, I've just read Killer in the Kremlin by John Sweeney. I really advise anyone listening to that book, audio book. Oh, that's how I, I listen to it, but read it whatever um really good book but just does go over some of the instances of the uh chechen sort of bombings and supposed terrorist activities uh that ended up not being terror well they weren't terrorist activities they were they were pretty much put in place by the russian government to foment discord and the dislike of the chechens and then they can go to war with Chechen and all this kind of stuff well uh, a Moscow railway station had to be shut after a man was reported to be seen with grenades and bombs. Russian Railways says passengers had been evacuated from Kursk station. There is increased intelligence that Russia is preparing for a big, scare quotes, terrorist attack. ISIS extremists will be blamed and the narrative that the USA and the West are helping these terrorists to undermine Russia. An easy way to control the public. Um, uh, late edition, just seen this today. In Kaluga, the FSB reports, quote, ISIS adherents planned to blow up tanks with fuel and lubricants at a chemical plant. Two natives of the countries of Central Asia resisted the arrest and were liquidated. More prep of the public. So this could be a genuine thing, but it just as likely because Russia have form here. I mean, that this is what they have done, undoubtedly done. I mean, when you see... Um, what happened at that was at that school as well in uh, I forget where where they stormed the school and basically just the collateral damage of all these dead people and it didn't need to be done that way and then the bombing in the theatre and on the subways and all these instances which were either really badly handled and cover up and there was loads of stuff that was taken advantage of that were genuine things happening or they were just completely um, you know masterminded by the russian F fsb themselves they they have really good form for doing this this kind of um this kind of 
activity. Uh, and general events here, so no report says another group of instructors from Iran has arrived in occupied Luhansk region to train Russian military on Iranian drones. This is reported by the Ukrainian general staff. Russia has already used more than 660 Shahids out of the 1,750 under contract. I'd actually thought they'd use more than that. Um, and finally, uh, uh, this is pretty significant, which is first time in almost two years, the price of natural gas in Europe is below 50 euros per megawatt hour. Nobody in Russia is talking about the energy war anymore because in this field, Russia has decisively been defeated. Ukraine will finish the job. Um, this is this is very important. I think some a Russian propagandist did mention that that it was such a shame that Europeans didn't freeze to death over winter or something like that on one of the TV shows the other night. But that's a recognition that actually there wasn't this energy crisis. Uh, part partly because actually global warming has meant we've had a really really warm winter, uh, comparatively speaking. But partly because actually. The EU and the US have done an amazing job in countering the weaponization of of energy that Putin has has been. This is an element of the war where Russia genuinely have been defeated. Like in trying to weaponize, they're they're saying right, this is one of the weapons we are going to use in this war against the West, in this war against Ukraine and their allies, uh, and that weapon was defeated. There is, there's no other way of saying it. So this is a real victory here. Uh, the, the the price caps and the way that the uh, energy markets have been dealt with, and the way that the Russian energy sector has been dealt with, I think. Uh, and I don't want to go into Nord Stream here, but but actually, the thing about Nord Stream actually, well, before the explosion, it was shut down. That that was a key. That like it wasn't being used. Uh, so you know the. Uh, yeah, I won't get onto that. But but effectively, this weaponization of, of energy ha has been a, a battlefront in this war, and it's been a battlefront which has been lost. Russia has lost that that battle, and you know that is that is significant, and that's excellent uh, policy making. There was a lot of talk about price caps not being would they be effective? Would this policy be effective? Would that policy? And actually, the the EU and the Biden administration have got together and they have actually done a really good job. And here is the evidence of that. I mean, that is phenomenal. So that 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 it means that Russia won't be making so much money. And it also means that that they won't have the desired effect on the European and, and global markets as they were hoping anyway there you go that's today's news please like subscribe and share thanks so much for being a part of this all the ways you can support the channel are in the description below uh, i'll get back to you later with a frontline update